Let's open your Bibles, if you're not there already, Genesis chapter 50, but we're going to be finishing out 49 with the blessing on Joseph and, uh, and Jacob's death and burial, and then finish out the book here. But let's open up with a word of prayer and commit this to the Lord. Father, again, we thank you that tonight, through your word, you want to touch our lives. Lord, it's every time we open this book, God, you're waiting for us to to get past just reading it, but open to receiving it and, and, and hearing your heart in the midst of it. And so, God, tonight... Do that work in us, each one, what we need, Lord. For those that are are, are not with us tonight because they're not feeling well, they're sick, they're dealing with issues, struggles, battles, uh, physically, Lord. Uh, and I know for Kim, Lord, I pray for my bride, my love, Lord. Continue in that work of healing and touch, Lord, in her life. And uh, strengthen her, restore her all the way. For others in the in, in similar places, Lord, uh, we, we lift up those that we love to you that need healing, that, uh, your touch on them. Lord, for Jack, I pray for, Lord, just swift and amazing healing, Lord, in his life with the, the st- battle he's been through lately, Lord. And thankful that he's here tonight, Lord, uh, wanting to receive. Lord, bless him. Lord, let him know that receiving and that touch. And Lord, go forward now. Stick in that place in our hearts what we need, Lord. Plant it deep, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So w- last week we, we went through chapter 49 for the greater part. And we looked at what's, what's called, the subtitle in your Bible may read as mine, Jacob blesses his sons. But really it's more of Jacob prophesies over his sons. You know, because we see there's there's some blessings, but really not all blessings, but all prophetic words concerning their lives. Some ups, some downs, some reminders of the sons that they are, whose sons they are, and uh, and what's become of their lives. What's been spoken and what has been written, as we're going to see as we get into the text in verse 28. We read, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel... This is what their father said to them. Speaking of what we what we read last week and what we're going to finish this week. This is what their father, Jacob, said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. I mean, some of them, the, a real blessing didn't suit them, you know? And the question for us is, you know, what would, what would be suitable for you and I? You know, I mean, I think about my life you know, before I recommitted my heart to the Lord, it, you know, I would have had one of these other blessings, one of these others. Hey, you know, first fruits, preeminent, dignity, power, all kinds of potential that was there for Reuben, as we saw it back in verse 3. And, but, but the word came, no, unstable as water, you know, and, and not so much of a blessing. He was disqualified. And I thought, gosh, you know, praise God, that we turn our lives over to Jesus Christ and he requalifies the disqualified and we are qualified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're qualified by the cross. And so in our text last week, we went through all of the brothers, the sons of Jacob, and we, we ended with Benjamin, but we skipped Joseph. And we remember we, in verse 27, we saw Benjamin, Joseph and Benjamin being the two youngest, the brothers, the, the son of, of Rachel, uh, and, and the, the sons of Rachel, I should say, the wife that, that Joseph loved, that Jacob loved so dearly. When he got the two wives, two for one, it wasn't what he wanted. Today, everybody wants two for one. He didn't want two for one. He just wanted one. He wanted Rachel, but he got two for one. And it's interesting in the end of this text, we're going to see again in chapter 50 that, that, that Leah, the sister of Rachel, found a place in his heart and he found a place beside her at death even. But the awesome news and the, the blessing in this is to see that here as much as we see ourselves as having issues, our own you know, imperfections, the Lord sees past that and the Lord sees fit to, to save us and change us. And so looking back at Joseph in verse 22 as we came to him, Benjamin, real quick, look at verse 27 again. I know I'm jumping back and forth, I almost forgot. Benjamin, what we read of him, just that one verse. Benjamin, 
is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. And when you look at Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin, and it, did any of you guys read the story from Judges chapter 3 of Ehud and Eglon? Ehud, the one that the Lord would raise up in Israel. And you guys read that? We talked about it last week. You got to read it. Judges chapter 3, it, it just, as I mean, had Ehud, this Benjamite. He's a Benjamite. And, and it talks about here devouring the prey and dividing the spoil, a ravenous wolf. You know, Ehud was that guy that had that sword and shoved it inside Eglon, the, the evil king. And, and it says, and the and the dung came out, you know. It's like uh, it just the stink, and and his sword went in. He had it. He had the special sword that he made himself, and it went in, and it went in so deep. Then this big, huge guy, he, he couldn't get it out, you know. But the dung came out, and uh, and you know, and he was a Benjamite, you know. Read the story; it's a great story. But uh, it's one of those things. Anybody? Any of you guys ever seen the uh, the the? It's a study Bible for little boys. It, it's got all those stories like that. All the gory stories are highlighted and underlined. You know, I don't know if they still make them. You know, but if, if you got know a little boy, get him one. So yeah, that's what I got to get one for my grandsons. You know, I got one on the way and one here. So, all right. So look at verse twenty-two. Joseph. Joseph. We know the the wonderful son, the favored son of Jacob. Jacob now in his, in his dying breaths on his deathbed, literally here, as he speaks of his sons, he says, Joseph is a fruitful bow. A, a, a fruitful bow by a spring. Not just a fruitful bow, but a fruitful bow by a spring. And his branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile, strong, by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. So this is cool. You look at Joseph, again, a fruitful bow. It, it, you look at Joseph's life. Joseph had fruit that couldn't be stopped. A, a fruitful bow by a spring, his branches running over the wall. You could not stop the fruit in Joseph's life, even though the enemy tried hard to stop the fruit in Joseph's life. And how did the enemy try to stop the fruit in Joseph's life and all that would come from it? Verse 23, the archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him, harassed him severely. And, and so who are the archers here? Most all would agree that the archers, the enemies of, of Joseph in his life, were those that should not have been. They were his brothers. It was his brothers. This, it was his brothers that bitterly attacked him and harassed him and sh it says shot at him. But again, it's those arrows like we talk about there in Ephesians 6, 16 where, where those arrows of the enemy that, that, the, that he shoots to try to take us out, to stop us, to, to drive us back. Joseph attacked, harassed severely by his brothers. Have you ever had an attack by your brothers? Have you ever taken shots? Have your brothers ever taken shots, I should say, at you? You know, I've been there, done that. You know, and, and I think, there, here's the deal. If your life is fruitful, if you are truly serving the Lord, then there are going to come attacks and you will be under attack. The worst place again, worst case scenario, by brothers. When it's others, I understand. When it's the enemy, but when it's a brother and they, they've, they've harassed you severely, they've taken shots at you, bitterly attacked, there's, it hurts. It hurts worse. I mean, anybody could have taken Joseph and thrown him into a pit and sold him as a slave, but when it was his brothers, it must have just destroyed him. You know, surely as a little boy, when he was young, his brothers would have been told, hey, watch after your brother, watch after your brother. Keep an eye out for Joseph. You know, but then at 17 and with the blessings and the dreams and God's hand on him. You guys understand too, that's why his brothers hated him. You can't get away from it. His brothers hated him because God had given him a vision. If God gives you, you know, he gave him dreams, but really they were dreams that were a vision of what was to come. If God gives you vision... And you're, and you're settled in your heart. I mean, he was faithful and in love with God, serving his father. You know what? 
there's brothers that are going to be jealous in your life. When you have the favor upon you, which Joseph had, and you'll have if you, if you submit your heart to God, if you have a heart that just wants after, you know, I want to be unmovable, I want to be unshakable, let my roots go down deep. In you, I want to be like a tree planted by streams of living water, like we sang in that song. This will be my song, Lord. This will be my prayer. I mean, that's what I want. To the end, to the end, like we sang in that song, you guys. When I was studying today, I listened to that song, and I didn't want to turn it off. I was just sitting in my office, just worshiping. This is so good. This is my song. I want to be unmovable. And for these guys, his brothers, they deserve nothing. But what did Joseph give them? Complete grace. Complete grace. These were the guys that shot the arrows. If you remember, I mentioned it already in Ephesians 6.16 when Paul describes the armor of God, the home armor of God that we are to put on that we might withstand what? The evil day and the evil one. And having done all to stand firm, oni pa'a, like we talked about recently. And to stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, shoes fit for our feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Ready to take the gospel out, whatever the case. I'm going to be there. Truth, righteousness at, at the forefront. And then verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which if you're going to serve God, you better take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Now, understand again, in all circumstances, you better have your faith ready because arrows are going to fly. And, and I look at this and I think, gosh, God had given Joseph this vision. He'd given him dreams. He'd given him favor. And his brothers couldn't handle it. And if he wouldn't have shared his vision, if he wouldn't have shared his heart, if his brothers didn't know his heart, really? I mean, they knew he was a good kid. They really did. But they couldn't handle it because they weren't. And I guarantee you again, listen, if you will be fruitful, then you will come under attack and sad to say that often it can come by brothers. Now, if that's to, cop, to come and to happen and to be, which we've seen all throughout the Word and in our lives, what's our response? Again, verse 24. Yet his bow, his bow, remained unmoved. His arms were made strong, agile, by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. And so, this is awesome. You guys, he didn't retaliate, though he could have fired back and wiped them out. Joseph's bow remained unmoved, and amazingly so. And the only reason so, it was by the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. You know, Jacob, his father, when, when he speaks his blessing upon his son, he understands, you know, the only way that that Joseph did not kill his brothers when they stood before him, when they came looking for food, bowing down to him as he is second in command over all of Egypt, of Egypt, gone from the place of slave to the place of servant to the place of, of jail, of jail, what do you call them? Uh, in jail, you know, <laughs> prisoner, thank you, uh, to the place of being set free in one day, going from jail to being hailed as second in command over all of the strongest nation known in the world, over Egypt under Pharaoh. In one day it happened. And he maintained his composure and his humility to the point when his brothers showed up, he, he restrained his bow. Though he was made strong, he was made strong by the mighty one of Jacob, the same one that made Jacob strong, that changed his life, held Joseph's life. And you guys, that's the way that you will be unmovable and unshakable is, you know what? You have your roots go down deep like we sang. So that God is the one that gives you strength to not fire back. I mean, I remember a few times in life, you know, and, and I can tell you times that I did fire back, but I know one time that I just, there was like, gosh, here's this opportunity. I could take this guy out. I could drop this guy. 
You know, seriously. And it was like, well, I wasn't me. I was in the Bible. I was reading my Bible. It was right where we were at Bible study on Wednesday night, or actually it was our midweek study. It used to be on Monday nights back then. We made it to Wednesday. We finally made it to midweek. <laughs> but we were in the book of Genesis, and we were looking at the life of Noah. And Noah being, a, Noah being a righteous man was found drunk by his sons. And uh, the one son uncovered his father and showed his nakedness to his brothers. And the other two went in backwards and covered their father's nakedness, knowing that he was a righteous man, but he'd blown it. And I thought, you know what? That's what the Lord's telling us to do. We're supposed to cover this guy and his, his, his sin. And I tell you right now, it could be 27 years of Calvary Chapel, maybe with a lot less struggles than we've tasted through the years. If I would have just uncovered it, pointed it out for everybody. And it wasn't me, though, because in me is uh, there is the man. And it's like, but, but the Lord, the Lord does that, you guys. That's why I want to stay. I need, that's why I was t sharing with you. I was singing today that song. I want to be, I want to be unmovable, but I need, the only way is I have to have my roots, I have to have my heart in His. I, I need to have His hand on, on me. The hand of the mighty one of Jacob. The hand, and again, remembering Jacob is that, Jacob is the one who became Israel, governed by God. Israel meaning governed by God. Jacob being deceiver, conniver, the imperfect. And so, by the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, the imperfect. I love it. He's the God of the imperfect, our God, and he gives strength to you and I in the times that we need it. You know, and I just pray that I can I can react that way, that God's hand would be on me and on you guys when it comes in our lives. Hey, you know what? I want to I want to be the one that continues to cover. Love does what? Covers a multitude of sin. By the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, from there is the shepherd from there is the stone of Israel by the God of your father who will help you by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above blessings of the deep that crouches beneath blessings of the breast and of the womb listen when you look at this here we've got you know the mighty one of Jacob the, the, the mighty one of the imperfect and then we have the one of the shepherd. There, from there is the shepherd. He's the mighty one of Jacob. He's the shepherd. He's the stone, again, the, the immovable, we could say. The stone of Israel. I love it, too, when you look at it. He's the stone of Israel. Israel meaning what? Again, right? Who's got it? Governed by God. So he's the mighty one of Jacob, the imperfect. He's the stone of those governed by God of Israel. And so, but he's not the stone of those aren't, that aren't governed by God. You know, he won't be the, he'll, he'll be a rock that falls on you rather than the rock that you and I are to fall on. If you fall on the rock, you'll be saved. If that rock falls on you, you know what? You're going down. But the promise here again, when we look at these names, these five titles we could say in verse 24 and 25, there's the mighty shepherd, there's the stone of Israel, there's the God of our Father who will help you, and there's the Almighty who will bless. And how does he bless? With blessings of heaven above. Again, he, he has things for us, God has stuff for you and I that we don't know. Jesus, when he was there with the Samaritan woman at the well and the, and the disciples went to get food and they came back, hey, don't you want some food? We got some food. It's like, hey, I have food that you don't know about. Like, how oh, could that be? You know, the food, the blessing that he had was this woman that was right there in front of him that found salvation, that asked the right questions of the right person. Again, blessings of heaven above that come from where? The Almighty. Who will bless you? Listen, who will bless you? Where are you looking for blessings at in your life? Where do you, where do you and I look for blessings? Where do you, where do you look for help? You guys, who's your shepherd? Who's the one that leads you? Again, what would be the suitable blessing for your life were it to be written today? 
All these things come into play. They're all factors in our lives. Who's your shepherd? Where, where, where's the rock that you that you lay upon, and and who's the mighty one in your life? The blessings from heaven above, you guys. Again, so important. Not here. We're always looking for blessings from here. I mean, I know I am. I mean, I I, I think, gosh, whoa, this is great. You know, I look and I think, gosh, what what is God doing in my life? This is great. Something from here can be so good. Mangoes for one, okay, but that's maybe there. Those are from heaven, you know. But but I look and I think, you know what? The blessings of the deep, he says, that crouches beneath the blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings here, look at verse 26, of your Father. Blessings of God. They are mighty beyond the blessings, he says, of my parents. And so here Jacob is giving a blessing to his son Joseph, and he says, hey, the blessings of your Father. Again, the, the, the focus and the direction is to the Lord. Mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. All that I have for you, all that I could give to you, Joseph, is nothing compared to what God has for you. I mean, he's already seen the blessings of Joseph's life. God's hand. Joseph was a recipient of the blessings of God. Huge! I mean, could you imagine being a father? And you think your son is dead and you come to find out that he's alive and not only is he alive, but, but, but only God could put someone in the place that, that his, his, his son has found. You guys, that's what you and I have to degree in our lives. Those of you that have parents that maybe aren't saved and you give your heart to Christ and you truly live for Him and they get to watch and over years later they see your life after you've really lived for Christ and they say, you know what? There aren't a lot of men of God walking around these days. There aren't. But when you find a very real man of God, there's a lot of older Christian men taking the name of Christ and all the rest, and there's wonderful, wonderful, plenty wonderful. But but when you look at someone who's really walked with God and becomes that older man of God, and you look at them, you know, nobody can take that away. They're different. They're, they, they're separated, again, even as we see. Look, watch. May, the, may they, what the bounties of the everlasting hills, the blessings of, of beyond, uh, he says, may they, verse 26 in the midst there, may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was, here it is, set apart from his brothers. Joseph was set apart from his brothers. How was he set apart from his brothers? Well, he was set apart from his brothers in all kinds of ways. He had a heart that was honest. He had a heart that was pure. He had a heart that, that, that was open. And so God spoke to him. He was set apart because he'd received visions and, and favor and, and blessings. But at the same time, he was set apart, you could say, initially, very uncomfortably. That's what happens. He was set apart by what? by bitter attack, by, by being shot at and harassed severely. We, that's what happens. Jesus said, you know, if they hated me, understand they're going to hate you as well. And, and so you guys, it comes initially uncomfortably being set apart, which is what we're called to be. Holy, set apart, sanctified is the word in the in the, in the English language taken from the Greek where we get sanctified, it means set apart in the New Testament. We are to be those that are set apart from our brothers. And, it, and, I, and again, I look at that and I think, you know what? That's what I want to be. I want to be set apart from my brothers. What do you, what do you mean? You, you want to be better than your brothers? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, we should. You should. We should want to be better than our brothers. Not to be better than our brothers, because we're better than you. Better than you, Conrad. Oh, okay, maybe I'm not. Okay, But here's the thing. That's not the heart. The heart of it is, I want to be better because I want to be better for my father. I want to be better so that others can see. You know what? I remember, I remember years ago when I was reading my Bible, and you know, hey, that, you know, that came across again, one of those many places, that all things are possible with God. You know, and it wasn't just one of the places where you read it, but those exact words, all things are possible with God. And I thought, if all things are possible with God, then could God make me a better father than my father? Not my father in heaven, no way, you know, but my father who is now in heaven. 
My father, John Santos, could God make me a better father to my children than my father? All things are possible with God. You know what? And I thought, God, I want to be a better father than my father. And you know what? My father would want that. He would want that. And I don't know, I'm not saying that I am, but that should be our desire and that should be our goal, to be set apart from our brothers. You know, I want that Calvary Chapel would be few and strong, set apart from our brothers. Not that people would say, oh, you're so much better. No, just because that should be the goal. To be better, to be holy, to be set apart. And you guys, and again, initially it's going to be uncomfortably. You know, the, the blessing for Joseph didn't come for after many years and many tears. I mean, who do you want to be? I want to be one that's set apart. You know, I, 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 I want to be one who, whose bow remains unmoved, that doesn't retaliate, doesn't fire back, I want to be one whose, whose arms are made strong and held back by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. The mighty one of the imperfect. I mean, what a great thing, you know, to be, to be the one that is set apart, but set apart in all, with all your imperfections, but set apart to God. I want to be one that, the one that's, that's there walking with my shepherd. I want to be one that, that is, is secure on the stone of Israel, being governed by God in my life. I want to be one who has God as my father. And I love that line, verse 25, the God of your father who will help you. You guys, we have a father who will help us by the almighty who will bless you. What does almighty mean? You know what? It means he can do anything. All things are possible with the Almighty. And again, the blessing, may they be on the head of Joseph. Coming from his father, what a cool thing. You know, he gets this blessing, you know, and, and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. And he's on his deathbed, Jacob is here now. And he's spoken to all of his sons, and, and now, except for Benjamin, who was last here, but he gives, he gives Joseph this, the, the bounty of the blessing. And just the joy in his heart to see his son again who he thought was dead. And then he turns to Benjamin and he says again, Benjamin, a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and in the evening dividing the spoil. And we went into that in detail last week of many of the Benjamites. Jonathan, Saul was a Benjamite. Jonathan was a Benjamite. Saul of Tarsus was a Benjamite. Maybe named after Saul the king even, but renamed Paul by Jesus. But all these, verse 28, are the 12 tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh included there, as we mentioned. And this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Verse 29, Then he commanded them and said to them, I, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field, uh, I'm sorry, bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And there they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah, Jacob says. Leah, again, the one that... that Two for one, wives, you know, and, and, and he says, I want to be buried there by her. Verse 32, the field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. You guys, when they bought, you know, when, I should say, when he bought the, the field, when Abraham bought the field there, uh, he bought it before he ever received the land. He bought the field with the promise of God that, hey, that, that field in the midst of that land, the land of Canaan, that that was all going to be theirs. It was going to be given to his family. And so he bought the field, believing God for the blessing before he ever received the blessing. Because I think that's the way you and I should be living and walking in our life. Walk like you're, like you're receiving the blessing. Like the blessing that God has promised to you is already yours. Because if he's promised, it is. You know, you have eternal life. You know what? Live like it. You know? That doesn't mean, hey, you live on the edge. But no, it means you live... You live in that place where you're set apart from your brothers. 
Yes, we've been given life and, and, and that eternal. How? But by the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to live like that. Well, how do you live like that? You know, that you, knowing that you've been given life eternal by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. How do you live like that? You know, you live your life for Him. If I died for you, you know what? You, you'd probably want to do and do blessing and, and honor and, towards my life. And, and you guys, Jesus died for us. We need to be living like, we, like we're going to see Him, like the promises that we've been given tell us that we will. But note here, and we'll, come, we'll see that again as we get towards the end here. But there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. Verse 31 in the midst. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Again, the field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. And verse 33, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed. He breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Again, you know, great words. It isn't like, and he died. No, you know, for those in the household of God, they get gathered to their people. He, he, went, he went to that place there in the center of the earth where the Lord called it paradise. Remember when he was there hanging on the cross and the one on one side and the one on the other, the two thieves, and they had both mocked him for some time. But as it came towards the end and the one thief had watched him as he as he prayed and as he cried out and as Jesus hung on the cross and he said, you know, surely this man has done nothing wrong. We deserve the, the death that we're facing, but he's done nothing wrong. You know, we deserve this. He doesn't. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew there is something real about this guy calling himself a king, being named as a king by others, being mocked as a king by others. He knew, even as a centurion knew, surely this is the Son of God. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember Jesus' words. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. You guys, we don't go to paradise, okay? We don't go to paradise. But, but you guys, to be absent from the body for us, you know, is to be present with the Lord. We've got the, the upgrade of all time. The church goes straight to be with Jesus. Before Jesus, they went to paradise and they waited for him. And he came for them. We're told that he went there and preached salvation to the captives. But for us, you guys, we've, re we've received salvation. And now we go straight to the front of the line. We go straight to that place where those who are set apart from their brothers will go. We go straight to the place where, again, we get to see our salvation. To see Jesus. I cannot imagine. I mean, I cannot imagine... You know, the joy people say, you know, how they're, they're excited to see their loved ones when they get to heaven. And that's all true. But I can't imagine. It's like, you know, my mom and dad, I'm excited to see them. I think it'll be great. But you know what? I've seen them before. They're wonderful. I love them. They'll be even better there. But only because Jesus is there. Jesus is there. We get to see Jesus. I can't wait. I mean, I want to I wanna not just hear, well done, good and faithful servant, you know, enter into the, 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 your master's happiness and joy and all that, but I just want to hear his voice. I mean, just to know that I'm there, you know. It's going to be so good. The promises that God has given us, gathered to his people, they were, you guys, for us, we mentioned it already, remember? What is it? Swallowed up by life. I remember the first time I saw that is when I was doing Maury Richardson's funeral service. First funeral service I ever did on Maui. First funeral service of my life was doing my father's funeral service on the mainland or celebration service, however you want to call it. You know, both believers, so it was guaranteed a celebration. But it was when I did Maury's that I came across that verse and I went, man, swallowed up by life. How do you get better than that? Well, verse, chapter 50, verse 1, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So, this, so the physicians embalmed Israel. Now, again, as soon as he's done, gives the blessing, prophesies over his sons, pulls his feet up into his bed and breathes his last, and is done. And Joseph, the one that falls down weeping over him and kissing him. We see jo Joseph quite a few different times in the word in his life weeping. Uh, 
but his weeping is always over another and for another. You know, surely maybe his own sadness here we could say, but but it, it's over him. You guys, it's it's like for us, you guys, what do, he wasn't he wasn't like his brothers that were weeping over getting caught, weeping over being busted, weeping over the the evil that they did, but just because they'd been found out when they stood before Joseph, only to find out that they were standing before Joseph. Before they ever knew it was Joseph, they understood we're being punished because of what we did to Joseph. And here they are standing in front of Joseph. And Joseph, he couldn't handle it. How many times did he run away and weep? You know, oh my gosh, it's my brothers. Why, why did he weep? All he wanted to do was be loved by his brothers. All he wanted to do is be a part of the family that God had given him and, and to have that love. And, and now he's wondering, is it going to happen? And now in our story, we know it's all happened. And now he's in command and his father has passed and his dad is being now embalmed. It was a tradition in, his, uh, in, in Egypt. And embalming was something that was special. It was done for the pharaohs. It was done for the elite you know, 40 days, verse 3, were required for it. For that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. And so 40 days for embalming, but 70 days of weeping by the Egyptians. Jacob, it seems, in these years he was here, under Joseph's rule and reign under Pharaoh, Jacob had, had come to a place of, of great honor in the nation as well. I mean, 70 days they wept over him. It was 72 days that they would weep for a king or a pharaoh that were, was, was assured for them. And, they, and, here, and, and this, this service of embalming went on. Again, for a pharaoh, they would embalm them and then they would place them, as you know, in a, in a great tomb. And they would not just embalm them, but they would also, you know, kill and embalm uh, their wives and they would take their servants and kill them all and they'd get kind of the, the, the lesser embalming or what have you, you know, and they would place them, you know, because they and they'd put a lot of food in there with them and they would, they basically, because you know, when they woke up in the afterlife they wanted to be able to have their wives and their servants, so it's like, hey, you guys are going with him, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, craziness I know <laughs> But don't worry, we'll embalm you, you know? You're going to look great, you know? <laughs> and they put food in there. All the, It's craziness. But you guys, 70 days they wept for him, and when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, for Now I have found favor in your eyes, if I have. Please speak to the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I have hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan there you shall bury me so my dad told me I want you to take me home I want you to bury me there in Canaan now therefore he asked Pharaoh please let me go up and bury my father and then I will return and Pharaoh answered and he said go up and bury your father he has made you swear and so Pharaoh, and so, I'm sorry, so Joseph, verse 7, went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen, there in Egypt. And there they went up, with him also both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And so you look at this and I think, you guys, he's in this great company, Joseph is, as he takes his father's body embalmed, mummified basically, uh, to put him in his tomb. And with him, I mean, again, a great company, you bet. Uh, the ser all the servants of Pharaoh, and I mean, does that mean Pharaoh had no servants left? It's just speaking, there, there were many. The elders of his household, again, Joseph's own household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So this was one crazy, very great company. You know, chariots and horsemen, his brothers, all their household. It's like this is a huge, huge, huge entourage with an army, basically, coming into Canaan. And so when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, verse 10, which is beyond the Jordan, nobody's going to mess with these guys. Pharaoh's making sure 
Nobody's going to mess with them and they'll be able to come back safely. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father for seven days. Verse 11, Now the inhabitants of the land, when the Canaanites saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. You know, these guys, this is huge. Something big is happening here. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. And so they went basically the back way around uh, and up to Canaan and to east of the Jordan there. And, and it's kind of the same, the same route that Israel would take later when they leave in the Exodus. Uh, but look at verse 12. This is classic. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them, Jacob's sons, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, and they buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abram bought with the field of, of from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. And so again, you know, from Abram to Isaac to Jacob, you know, next here Joseph we will see as well all desiring to be buried there in the promised land, believing God for his promise before it was received. You know, the word from, from Joseph, I mean the word from Jacob and would be the word from Joseph as well. Hey, bury me at home. Take me to the land of Canaan. You know, you know he's, and again, how, how would they do that? Why would, he, why would Abraham ever buy it? Abraham bought that, that cave by faith. And, each, and Isaac after him and Jacob after him and then Joseph as we're going to see in our story as well. Hey, that's home. Egypt, that picture of the world where Joseph had everything. He was second in command. Man, where did he come to fame? Where did he receive all of his glory? In Egypt, that picture of the world. He's like, I don't want to, this, this is not home. Egypt for Joseph wasn't home. You guys, Egypt for me is not home. It's like, I want to go, I want to go where God is calling me. I want to be where, where, where I hear his voice. I remember when my, when my dad passed away and, uh, and my mom was, you know, grieving and, you know, uh, and she wanted to get together with my brother and sister and I and our families and she wanted us to go with her up to Fort Dick Beach in uh, Northern California, right about it, just at the border of, of Oregon, uh, just up above Crescent City up there. Place that we used to go as kids. We would go to Jedediah Smith State Park up there in the Redwoods, and then we'd go down to the beach, which was just a half day's drive to hang out there, and, and just this big, long beach full of driftwood, and we just had some wonderful memories there. My mom's like, I want to go back there with you guys and your families, and we're going to spread your father's ashes. And then when I die, you know, I want you to spread my ashes there too. And so we tried, and it didn't work, and this and that, and illness, and you know, different things that went on with life, and and it never happened. And uh, and then it, and my dad sat in the closet, you know, <laughs> for a while, you know. Now where's daddy? He's in the closet. Oh gosh, you know, come on, let's put him on the mantle or something, you know. But um, anyways, finally, when when she was ready to go, she said, you know, I want you guys to take your father's ashes and mine and I want you guys to spread our ashes up there at Fort Dick Beach on the beach up there and uh, so finally after you know she would passed him time went by and we figured it out to get a time where my brother and one of his sons was able to go and my sister and her family and I uh, and my family all went up there and made the journey to San Francisco and drove up the coast and all. It's not it's not an easy place to get to Fort Dick Beach, especially from Hawaii. But even from Southern California, it's a trek. And my sister coming from Vegas. And so, long story short, when we got there, uh, it came the day that we're going to go out to Fort Dick Beach, and we're just wondering, my brother and sister and I, what's it going to look like? You know, 
40 years later, you know, kind of thing. When's the last time we were there? It was 40, 50 years ago, probably, almost, you know? And uh, we got there, it looked exactly the same. Exactly the same. I mean, the, the area had hardly changed at all. It's not like coming to Maui 40, 50 years later, like, whoa, things have changed. <laughs> not, not much had changed. The one thing that had changed, or maybe it was there and we'd missed it, I don't know, but there is this amazing, we're leaving after doing the ashes. i got to skip ahead to this part. It's too good. We're leaving there. As we're, I mean, this is how good God is. We're leaving there. You know, this time of, of spreading the ashes and praying and singing some songs and and on the beach there, and we're all hungry. We need to go find some food. My nephew goes on Yelp in the middle of Nowheresville. I mean, you cannot get more Nowheresville, seriously, than that. He goes on Yelp. He goes, oh, there's a place that's got five stars, Mexican place, like a half a mile down the road. I'm like, no way. We drive down the road. We get that. This is ridiculous. There's no way. And we get there, we, and there's this house and there's no sign out front or anything, but a little sign in the front door that says open. We're like, went in there. Amazing Mexican place, but again, that's how good God is. But when we got to the beach and we walked down there, we had the ashes and, and, uh, and the water is cold. I'm like, anybody want to go in the water? I'm not going. We're not going in the water. You know, they're going on the beach. And so we took and, and, we, and we just dumped them out together there on the beach. And it was amazing. It was like it's just like here they are. And you know how we knew where to where to do it? We walked down to the beach and we're looking around, where should we do this? What should we do? And I looked down on the ground and there is an arrow on the beach made out of driftwood put together. An arrow on the beach. And I was like, I think we're supposed to do it right here. Like, what in the world, you know? I mean that's how good God is. So we took and we spread their ashes out there. And then we took, and, and I took a big stick, and I, and I wrote, made a big heart in their ashes on the beach, you know, the black sand with the white ashes, made a big heart on the beach, and then wrote J plus M, John plus Margie in there, you know. I mean, they're together. Fiesta forever, you know. <laughs> but um, Jacob wanted to be with Leah, you know. I, I mean, the one, the one bummer about heaven, and I know it won't be a bummer when I get there. I know, I understand, but, but you know, that my wife isn't going to be my wife. I mean, I don't understand that. I don't see how that can be cool, you know. But, uh, you know, you better keep your arm around her while you can there, buddy, because, you know, she's, you know, not going to be yours when you get to heaven. So, but I look and I think, gosh, it's going to be good. God has such plans for us. I mean, and they're always, always good. Joseph didn't understand. What are God? What's he doing? You know, as he's going through life and suffering so much, as he as his, as he deals with his brothers, and then then finally now the loss of his father, and and look at what happens here. This is classic. Joseph returns to Egypt, verse fourteen, and buried his father and with his brothers. They'd all gone up with him to bury his father. I mean, I talk about how hard it was to get to Crescent City and then out to Fort Dick Beach. I mean, this was definitely much more of a journey. But again, they did it by faith, you guys. In verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, you know, and, and they've, got, they've gotten back, funeral's over. <laughs> they said, who? I mean, they're, they're thinking, Joseph's brothers are thinking like their father Jacob, you know, in his Jacob days. You know, oh, I mean, what are, what's Joseph going to do now that dad's dead, you know? I mean, that must be the scenario here, you know. We, we need to come up with a plan because dad's dead and Joseph, he just might have our heads, you know. I mean, they're, they don't know their brother. They still don't know their brother. They've lived with him. He's blessed him. He's given him all the riches and set him up and their families and loved on him, surely, during this whole time. But they still don't have a, a, a faith and a trust in Joseph that they should. And they, and they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. And so what? You know, all the rest was just a story. It was just a joke. It was just a line. You know, until dad died, then I'm going to get you. Well, that's what they would have done. Ah, that's what, isn't that what Esau planned? Esau had planned the same. Hey, when dad dies... Jacob, you're a dead man. 
When Jacob stole the blessing and the birthright, took those from him, you know, Jake, Esau kind of blew it as well. He sold the birthright. But he steals the blessing, he buys the birthright, kind of connives it out of his brother. And Esau says, you know what, hey, I, you know, when dad dies, you're dead. And so that's why Jacob left and started on this whole journey that he's been on. And now at the end of his journey, he's dead and his sons are afraid, you know, Joseph is going to kill us. So verse 16, they sent a message to Joseph saying, you know, oh, hey, by the way, dad meant to tell you, you know, I mean, and we don't know that that this happened or it didn't. We don't know. It, they sent the message to Joseph saying, hey, your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. I mean, it's like, hey, dad wanted you to really forgive us, Joseph. You know, and I know you love dad and we wanted to tell you, I don't know if you heard this, I don't know if he told you, but he told us. Yeah, yeah, he told us, all of us. You know, I was like, these guys are, they're knuckleheads and a half. They're just like us in too many ways. He dad meant to tell you, you know, I don't, I don't believe it for a minute. And so they said, and now, so please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And it says, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. You guys mean, hey, hey dad said, forgive us. They're afraid. You know, don't do evil to us because we did evil to you and they're, they're, they're confessing their transgression, but, but they still don't know their Savior. Joseph is their Savior. He saved their families from death in the, in the, with the famine. He, he, he not only saved them from death from the famine, he saved them from the, just the death of dying a, a, or living a life knowing that you've killed someone or sold him into slavery and thought he was dead and then missing that forgiveness I look at this and I think here Joseph he's weeping again he wept for his father when his father died he's weeping now again when they spoke to him why? because they didn't get it he's weeping because they didn't understand he loves them he, I, I love you I mean what they had done was forgiven you guys, I mean, for us, for our sin, you know, it's covered. It's covered. When we see Jesus, it's not going to be, there's going to be no surprises like, ah, oh, ah, ah, I got you to heaven. Now I got you. No, he's like, you've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. Your sins are covered. And you are so loved. I mean, when you see Jesus, it's what you did, what your sin and mine that put him on the cross you guys, it was all worth it to him. He understood. I mean, the difference between Joseph and Jesus is Joseph found out later that God's hand was all in, in all of this and the evil that was done against him, God meant for good. Jo Jesus went into it with his eyes wide open. He knew. He knew and he freely laid down his life for, his life for us. And again, forgiven. And watch this. Look at this. Forgiven and provided for, comforted and spoken to kindly. Watch this. Verse 17 again, uh, or the, the end of verse 17, as Joseph wept when they spoke to him, and then it says, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we're your servants. I mean, they come to him, hey, dad said you need to forgive us because of our sin and the evil we did. And he just starts weeping before them. And they start weeping. I think they get it now. Even before they say, Behold, we're your servants, you know. And Joseph said, Don't fear, for I am, in the place, am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Before those words ever came out of his mouth, I think that they could see it in his face. You know, do you not know me that well? Do you think that I'm going to harm you? You know, and he just starts weeping again. They've seen this before. Where did they see this before? Well, when he revealed himself to them. And they're like, oh no, it's Joseph. And he's weeping and he's crying. He's hanging on their necks and loving them. You know, you, didn't, you don't fake that kind of stuff. It was real love. And when you and I stand before God and, then we, and when you meet Jesus, talk about real love. Again, I can't wait. But you guys, it comes at a cost. 
It comes at a cost. And their, their salvation by way of Joseph in that sense, you guys, came at a cost. He suffered greatly for the gain that they would receive. And so again, look at verse 18. His brothers, they also came and fell down before him. And they wept and they said, Behold, we're your servants. And Joseph said to them, Here, I love it. Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not your judge. And here it is. I mean, God allowed this. He says, As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so do not fear, for I will provide for you and for your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You meant evil against me. He said, I, 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 know, what, I know what you did. You, I, know, I know how evil you were. I was there. You threw me in the pit. I lived through all that pain. And, he, and Joseph had the, the understanding and the sense about him because of his relationship with God. He knew when it had happened. God meant it for good. Once it was done, God meant it for good. God allowed this. I mean, surely, I mean, he must have probably thought along the way, you know, man, God's hand has been in this. Look, I'm, you know, I'm thrown into a pit, but look at, look at my boss. He loves me. I found favor here, you know, with my boss and over the whole household of Potiphar, you know, and next thing you know, <laughs> that didn't go so good. Maybe God's hand isn't out and he's into prison. And next thing he raises up in prison as, as you know, overseer there in the jailhouse. And, and then and that didn't go so good afterwards. And then finally, all of a sudden, he's taken out of that prison and put second in a command under Pharaoh. And probably, I'm sure, thought, gosh, God is good. God has done this. But it wasn't until he saw his brothers bowing before him that he realized what they meant for evil, God meant it for good. God has allowed this. And you guys, some of the worst things that I've experienced in my life, in ministry and serving God, you know, the arrows and the bitter attacks from brothers. I mean, I'd say probably the greatest pain that I've ever experienced in ministry, you know, has been from brothers not probably guaranteed you know and the, and the worst part is like you know for me whatever but when I see it affect my wife and I see her suffer alongside because of what brothers have done when I see it affect my children and people taking their children away from my children when they're just little children they're little children and you take them away and, and I see my children suffering because of brothers? And I look at that and I think, you know, why, Lord? Why? And, but you guys, the worst of the arrows and the bitter attacks, I know, and I've seen it even recently, but, but in, in those years when it was happening, God was using it for good in my life. How could God use any of that stuff for good? You know what it did? It pushed me closer to him. It made me check and see and make sure of my calling and my election, as the word tells us. Make your calling and your election sure. I had to know. I had to know that I could, that God was calling me because I'm not going to take my family through that kind of pain. I don't want my heart to break over and over through that kind of pain. But you know what? Whatever it is, you guys, I want to, I'll do it for Jesus. I wouldn't do it for anybody else. I wouldn't do it for any of you. You know, I mean, I, I, a lot of stuff, I don't know that I would do for my wife or my children, but, you know, it's like, but for Jesus? For Jesus for my wife, for Jesus for my children, for Jesus for you, you know what? That's why we lay our lives down. There's the great, the, the, the greatest wonder and glory that this world has ever known came through the greatest suffering and pain that this world has ever seen. Jesus on the cross. For the joy set before him. And again, he endured the cross, scorning it shame. And then to think that you and I are that joy. I mean, it's seriously, what a joke. 
you think about it, you know, but, but we know that, right? We know that. That you and I are the joy set before Jesus, that he endured the, the pain of the cross and all that for. Listen, Joseph's brothers, don't you know, they were the joy. And he didn't even know it. They were his persecutors. But they became the joy set before him. That he got to be a part of seeing them and, and seeing them saved. Remember back in, what was it, in chapter... Chapter 30. No, what I'm going to say in chapter 30. I don't know why I even said that. But uh, in chapter uh, 43, as he reveals himself to his brothers as they come, and, and, and I love it, at the end of chapter 43, there we are, uh, he put them in line. So cool. As he, Joseph takes them in and, and has them be with him and serves them himself, you know, with the Egyptians on the side. The Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews because that was an abomination. In verse 33, his brothers sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And so Joseph set them all up and lined them up in order of their birthright. And the men looked at one another in amazement. They're like, you know, I mean, maybe the youngest looked the youngest compared to the oldest, but how do you divide and design? It's like Joseph knew. And he puts them together like that. And it says in verse 34, portions were taken to them from Joseph's table. And Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. You guys, they hung out and they had a good time. Joseph had never experienced such a good time with his brothers before this day. You know, this is, this is what Joseph wanted. This is what he'd always wanted, to be loved by his brothers. And they go from afraid to washed and fed and filled with joy, and that's what Jesus does for us. For the joy set before him, and even still, though, in Revelation, in chapter 3, verse 20, we're told that, behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Who does he say that to? He says it to the church. Who does he say that to? He says it to the church of Laodicea. He says it to the church of the last days. He says it to the church that's in famine and, and doesn't even know it. He says, you say that I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. You don't realize, he says, you are wretched. You're pitiful. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. You know, buy for me, I counsel you, gold refined by fire that you might be rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and cover the shame of your nakedness that it may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous, he says, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. I mean, that's all that Jesus wants. That is all that Joseph wanted. You know, just to be restored. And he says, not only will he eat with me and I with him, but the one who conquers, he says, I will grant to him to sit with me on my father's throne. How cool is that? I mean, you don't get better than that. So in our text, he comforts his brothers. Look at verse 20 again. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He had a plan to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you. You know, And you, you who have, and all the evil that you've done to me, I'm going to provide for you and your little ones. And thus, I love it, thus he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Why did he do that? Because he wasn't like them. You know, it's like, I'm so glad Jesus isn't like me. You know, Jesus is, you know, beyond Joseph, he's the one that brings comfort. He's the one that has kind words. It's the kindness of God that leads man to repentance. Paul tells us in Romans, the kindness of Where's his kindness? His kindness is found in his words. You know, you look at the words of Jesus and you, and you look at it, and we've talked about it many times, the places where it doesn't say it, but you know it. And Jesus smiled and said, you know, and Jesus smiled and, and, and reached out and touched. I mean, it doesn't say it, but you know it. 
That's one question I have for the Lord when I get to heaven. Why doesn't it, it tell us, and you smiled, you know? Because we know you had to have smiled. He smiled as he said, you know, remove that plank from your eye before you go trying to take the little splinter out of your brother's. Like, you know, and I think the Lord would answer, you know, because you knew it already. You knew it. You, you, you know my heart. You guys, and one day we're going to get to see that smile. Again, thus he comforted, thus he spoke kindly to them. You guys, for you and I, Jesus, what he has is forgiveness, provision, comfort, and kind words. In verse 22, we'll finish this fast. Joseph remained in Egypt, and he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. So they went back to Egypt. He served and finished his time there. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children also of Mechir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. If you remember, Ephraim and, and Manasseh were counted as Jacob's sons. Uh, but he says these were counted as his own. In verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. From everything we can understand from the text, his brothers, all of them, his older brothers, his younger brother Benjamin, but all of his older brothers still alive. And Joseph finishing life at 110 years old. And I think, gosh, you know, what a full life, you know? Even though he's, he was the, the youngest of his brothers, say Benjamin. What a full life. What an amazing life. You look and you read as we have these last months that is looking at his life. There's nothing better. I mean, what a great life. You guys, I want to be able to look back at my life and say, you know, hey, nothing better. I've done and, and, and places that I wish I could have done better, but now, you know what, now that I know the Lord, I, I can walk and I can do better. And I can go to that place and I can understand, listen, with God's hand, the mighty one of Jacob on me, the imperfect you know what? My bow can, my bow, I should say, can remain unmoved. My my fruit can can branch over the wall. You can't stop the fruit that's going to come from your life, or your life, or mine. You know what? When we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, and though even brothers might come, archers bitterly attacking the world, shooting at you, harassing severely. You guys, the Lord allows us to be strong, not retaliate but be unmovable and shakable because we have a shepherd, the stone of Israel, the God of our Father who will help us, the Almighty who will bless us with blessings from heaven above. Joseph told the sons of Israel to swear, saying, God will surely visit you and he will. We'll see it coming up in the next book of Exodus and you shall carry up my bones. I want you to take me home too. Amazing. He doesn't want it, though he's been so blessed in Egypt. It isn't home. He knows it. Carry up my bones from here. And so Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And 400 years later, Exodus chapter 1, which we'll jump into uh, next week, or the week after, but we'll see. Anyways, let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, so much for these pictures and these types that all point us to Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. Lord, I thank you for this book. What an amazing blessing to look at the beginning of creation and the world and how from the before the beginning of creation, Lord, we know you had a plan. You had a plan for salvation, not just for the Jewish nation. Lord, we'll see that as we get into Revelation. But you had a plan for the salvation of any that would turn their eyes to you. Lord, for those that would look to you as looking to a Messiah that would come. Lord, those that would go to paradise and be freed and set free, God. How amazing. What a joy. What a story to hear when we see them. But Lord, that, that we here today could know you. And know, Lord, that, that the heart of God and the love of Christ is ours. For any that would call on your name, Lord, salvation would be ours. Lord, I thank you that you've given us a story to tell that's of love and of joy. That's of forgiveness and provision and comfort. 
and that the kindness of God, Lord, that, that with, Lord, as it has with us, lead us to repentance. And so, Lord, we ask you this, mor- this evening, Lord, lead us, guide us, Lord. Help us to be captured by your heart more and more every day as we prepare our hearts for that day that we see you. That we would be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, Lord. Help us, Lord, right now. We need it. We can't do this on our own, Lord. You understood the times that we would be in right now. And so you you have a plan for us right now. Help us not to to grow weary in doing good. Help us not to fear in this time of world uncertainty, Lord, because we know the one who created the world and has the plan. Lord, even as Joseph went through horrendous times, Lord, he trusted you. Lord, and salvation was his, Lord, as we go through this time. Lord, we trust in you, and we know that ultimately salvation is ours, Lord. And so we thank you, God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Lord, help us. Help us to be, Lord, even as we sing, unmovable, unshakable. Let our roots, Lord, be down deep in the things, the Word of God, like trees planted by streams of living water, Lord. Your Word, Your Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.